Travis Collins holds MS and PhD degrees in electrical and computer engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dr. Collins' research is focused on small cell interference modeling, phased array localization, and high-performance computing for software-defined radio. He has extensive experience developing for SDR applications in many different software environments and hardware architectures, and remains active in several open-source-based SDR projects. Currently, Dr. Collins works as a development engineer for analog devices in the Systems Development Group. There, Dr. Collins is responsible for transceiver applications, among others, and works heavily on hardware and software integration projects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those watching live and to those watching on YouTube uh, after the conference. My name is Travis Collins, and my talk is entitled GNU Radio in a Direct RF World. Uh, and this talk will focus around using very high-speed converters in GNU Radio um, and how I use them uh, personally uh, with uh, these very, very fast devices. Uh, when we're talking about fast, we mean uh, multiple giga samples a second. So very, very high-speed devices. Now, just uh, a little background on me. Um, I'm a senior algorithms engineer in the systems development group at Analog Devices. Uh, I work on a number of different products. Uh, I help maintain GRIO, which is the GR, which is the, the auto tree module to connect to a number of devices that uh, ADI produces. Um, I work on a number of libraries like LibIO, Lib89361, a few others. Uh, I maintain uh, the Python module PyADIIO. I hope everyone's sensing a theme here uh, in regards to IO. Uh, and uh, I do support uh, a number of different hardware components uh, like Pluto, um, the FM comms boards, uh, other transceivers, other high-speed components, uh, sensors, low-level things. Um, and if you've come to the ADI support forum called Engineer Zone, um, it's likely that I've answered uh, your question about Pluto or GNU Radio uh, or something similar. Now, just a, a bit of outline uh, of the talk. Uh, first, I just want to have a little bit of background on architectures of different radios, uh, just so everyone's on the same page when I talk about direct RF. Uh, then I'll introduce a modern uh, direct RF solution uh, that I work on on a daily basis, uh, just to bring some context and show some cool pictures of hardware, uh, like everyone likes to see. Uh, and then we'll move on into the data paths and talk about how fast these devices really are and the amount of data that, that's coming off of them. And, and then we'll move on into a discussion of some strategies that I've used uh, or I recommend or uh, different tools uh, to help handle that, the, that high-speed data coming back. So let's just begin with some background. Uh, historically, uh, there are three main radio architectures, uh, Superhead, um, Zero IF, some call, sometimes called uh, heterodyne, uh, and the latest, which we're really interested in, uh, called uh, direct RF or direct sampling. Now, uh, Superhead are devices that have a single or multiple IF um, or intermediate frequency stages. Um, these devices are uh, really considered like traditional designs, um, but modern SDRs, uh, modern radios that, custom, that uh, people develop uh, still use this architecture. Um, here on the left, we see uh, just an image of a, uh, an X310 that has a pair of twin RXs, which are actually Superhead um, designs, uh, as well as like a super old school uh, kind of radio that you would see uh, probably in your, your grandfather's basin or something. Um, but so Superhead, you know, the big advantage is that um, the analog performance is pretty extreme just because we can put filters and, and uh, all kinds of processing or analog components in the signal chain, uh, but at the cost of board space, power, uh, number of components, um, and usually flexibility. So when you put a filter down, usually it's pretty fixed. Now, um, moving on to zero IF, uh, which is usually what we think of when we talk about uh, SDRs or modern SDRs. Um, this architecture uses no IF stage. So instead it uses just a single mixer to mix things down to baseband. Uh, this architecture is in devices like Pluto, like Blade RFs, uh, Sidekicks, uh, USRPs like the B210. Um, uh, the, the new N-series devices have, have devices like these, like anything that's based off of the 9361 or 71 or any transceivers from ADI. I'll use this zero IF architecture. Um, zero IF is uh, uh, the big advantage is like it's highly integrated, so you don't need a lot of components around, um, and it's very flexible. So you can have large LO ranges, large bandwidth changes, 
Um, but the consequences are that you need algorithms to handle things like mixing products or desync components that are involved. And this is why um, Zero F has only been around for, for a couple of decades compared to Superhead. Now, finally, uh, this brings us to the last architecture, Direct RF, uh, where we basically hook a very high speed ADC or DAC uh, directly up to the antenna. Uh, here we're kind of showing um, the, the converter hooked up to you know, an LNA, which you would naturally have, or, or a PA. Uh, on the on the DAC side, um, but a very very simple uh, uh, receiver transmit chain. Um, here we're just showing a, a simple uh, FMC base card, um, and these are really common in the space. Um, and these would just hook up to like a, a standard FPGA or a, a bigger chassis with multiple of these cards in it. But very very high speed converters inside these on the gig sample per second realm. Now, but the the real the real question is why. Why direct RF? What is the really kind of design advantage here? Um, so it's it's not all good. Uh, there is some bad. Uh, the, the the main advantage uh, is that uh, we can uh, decrease the complexity of the RX and TX channels. Um, so we can remove components. We can remove mixers and, and lots of filters and uh, other additional pieces um, and really simplify that chain. Um, we can reduce the number of independent channels that you might need if you need to pull in a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so instead of having like four receivers, um, that all have a specific bandwidth. You could have a single receiver or a single ADC that pulls in that entire bandwidth slot. Um, and as I kind of mentioned before, uh, you know, smaller footprint because uh, you're less devices in the chain, um, and uh, the device, uh, since you got less components, that'd be much much simpler to synchronize multiple of them together. Now, the the bad side is that um, you have to be able to handle that kind of data rate. So when you have giga samples a second coming in. Uh, that's a lot of processing power that you need on the back end to handle. Um, and I would say like the less commonly known um, downside to direct RF is the dynamic range requirements. So when you're pulling in gigahertz of bandwidth, uh, so we have just a little kind of plot here uh, over, over frequency range. Uh, if you have a signal that's very loud, which we have on the right here, um, that's going to drown out possibly other signals that we'd want to be interested in, like the one on the left here. Um, we might want to, you know, this is the signal that we're interested in, and we can't simply turn up the analog gain because we would actually saturate because this signal uh, would be uh, would dominate uh, the other ones. So it's a very um, common problem in, in direct RF is this dynamic range problem. Now, just to bring some more context, uh, let's look at an example device uh, that's used in this space, something that I use uh, on a daily basis, daily basis, uh, something like the uh, eighty ninety eighty one or ninety eighty two. So these are um, highly integrated chips. So on a single chip, we have uh, quad DACs, quad ADCs um, that have very high bandwidths. Uh, so uh, they can be on the order of four gig samples or six gig samples on the ADC side and 12 gig samples a second on the DAC side. Um, and then these chips have lots and lots of DSP inside them. Uh, so for example, uh, grab my pointer here. Again. Um, in the red, we have uh, the, the, the TX or the DAC side, uh, we have uh, these fine up converters and, and coarse uh, up converters, and then on the, the ADC side we have the reverse, uh, and we'll get into these these what we call channelizers later on, uh, and how you can use use them for different applications. Now, just to give you some perspective on what these devices might look like, if you get them in your lab or you're just interested, in, um, here we just have a 9081 eval card. So this is what you get from ADI um, that's slotted up to a ZCU 102 uh, Xilinx eval kit. Uh, and for reference, here's just a Pluto that we say. So these these kits are, are these boards are pretty large. Uh, the chips themselves are pretty big on them, uh, but super highly integrated. Um, on the right here, we see that uh, all four ADCs and all four DACs are pinned out, uh, and we have a big power solution just to give you some reference on uh, what this device might look like. So next, uh, I want to discuss a bit more about uh, the speed um, or, or how fast these devices really are. And to do this, I think the best perspective uh, is actually from the HDL workflows, where we actually can see uh, the data coming in from the converters um, and how um, fast the clocks are uh, in the places where, you know, inside the FPGA, where we think everything is, is uh, pretty fast in general. Um, so, but I wanted to start from just to give you perspective on something that's a bit of a little bit more familiar. Um, and we're going to start with the actual Pluto reference design uh, or the, the reference design that's used. Uh, for 89361 um, type, type devices from analog devices. Um, so in in this image, uh, in the middle, we actually see like an, uh, an FPGA carrier board. 
uh, in the center of that is the fabric. So th these are like the blocks inside uh, the, pro the programmable fabric itself. Uh, on the top, we have a representation of the zinc or microblaze uh, that'll be running on the carry board. Uh, and this will be connected uh, through uh, DDR into the fabric. Um, and then on the right, we would have a FMC card like an FMCOMS, or uh, in the case of Pluto, this would just be uh, directly connected instead of uh, through FMC um, up to uh, the fabric uh, of the FPGA. Now, in the case of 9361, um, data comes in across LVDS or CMOS um, at about uh, 122.88 uh, megabits per second, or mega samples per second, excuse me. Um, and then that data is rearranged because um, it doesn't actually come in uh, at uh, at uh, uh, 12 bits per clock as you, as you might expect. Uh, it's a little bit different than that. Um, so we actually reorganize that um, and outside of this interface core here, uh, we actually get samples that you would expect. Uh, so here we have 32-bit uh, wide uh, samples. So these are for uh, dual channel I plus Q. Um, and then those are packed um, into a, like a bigger um, uh, uh, a bigger sample and then passed into DR. So in this configuration, um, you uh, you have a data rate at about uh, 61.44 uh, megahertz at most. Um, so and this is actually per uh, valid based on the valid clock or, or the or the valid strobe that you get from the, from the transceiver. Uh, so in uh, LVDS mode, um, the main clock inside the system will actually run at 4x the data rate. Uh, so this will be up at technically two, around 250, uh, but you'll only get a sample every four clock cycles. Um, in CMOS mode, like how Pluto is configured, uh, you get uh, one sample per clock cycle. Now, uh, if we uh, transition over to the, uh, the 9081, uh, things are a bit different. Um, so. Um, you know, you can see first of all that there's a lot more IP cores uh, inside the FPGA. Um, but one of the main differences, uh, if we start off at the FMC card, um, is that the interface is much much faster. So um, this is actually using JSD, uh, JSD 204B uh, or C, depending on the mode that you're using. Um, and that's so that's a JDEX standard uh, where we can generate a high speed link uh, to the device instead of having many many LVDS lanes. Um, and then, uh, so data comes in at this high speed link, and then we repack it uh, in a, a number of different steps um, through our different cores. Um, and then at the end, uh, we can see that we're getting, uh, we have a data width of 512 bits at 250 megahertz. So that translates roughly into, uh, or exactly into uh, 16 samples per clock, uh, which will actually generate uh, four, uh, four giga samples per second. So pretty extreme. You know, we're talking about a, uh, a change in uh, roughly um, you know, 16 times uh, two or four uh, rates uh, difference between, um, between the, the 9361 or the typical transceivers you would see in something like Pluto uh, and, a, and a device like this. So pretty extreme speeds. Um, but obviously uh, you know, people would wanna use these uh, in multiples. So we have uh, designs like this, where we're taking uh, four uh, 9081s and putting them on a single board. Uh, and you, know, you can think that uh, in a single config or a single device where we're getting four gig samples a second, um, you know, something like this uh, would produce you know, four times that. So pretty, pretty extreme amounts of data. Uh, so for reference, just uh, to just show you what this might look like, you know, back to our old kind of unit of measure here, uh, Pluto. Um, so this is a pretty beastly board uh, with uh, you know 16 uh, transmit and 16 receive channels um, all synchronized together uh, on this guy, and then you know we have to see it all uh, running and lit up. Uh, here's just an example of it running with a VC118. This is just a standard Xilinx eval card or eval uh, eval board, um, and we can see all 16 uh, transmitters and receivers all pinned out uh, on their, uh, MMCX, um, interfaces here. And, um, so the, the LEDs are kind of bright uh, on this rev, uh, but they've actually been, been calmed down quite a bit. Uh, but just to show you some, some kind of cool hardware here. Now, but the, the question is, uh, how do you use gigahertz of bandwidth, right? Um, are you just directly connecting this, uh, into GNU radio? Um, so, you know, what, maybe we can ask a, a simpler question. 
you know, say we're talking about USB or uh, Ethernet or PCIe, uh, how close can we get uh, to uh, a typical throughput uh, using those type of interfaces if we want to stream from you know that uh, the ZCU 102 or the VCU 118 back into computer radio? Um, so we're, if we just take like the theoretical max um, of these interfaces, you know, this is ignoring overhead or um, uh, you know any encoding or jumble frames or those types of things. Um, we don't really get close. Um, so PCIe uh, and 10 gig are kind of the realms that we want to be in. Um, but you know we're talking about uh, you know PCIe uh, that we would have um, you know one almost one lane per sample. That's the kind of order that we're talking about to actually just move data from the the eval board to uh, back to your PC for GNU radio to process. So pretty pretty extreme speeds here. Now um, when we're actually talking about handling this data, if we can get it back to the device, of course or get it back to our uh, PC, of course, uh, there are four main approaches that uh, I, I've taken or that I, I've recommended um, people use when they're uh, trying to use a device like this uh, with GNU Radio. Uh, the first thing is really always, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, dropping samples on the floor, we ref usually refer to that as overflows. Um, and you'll see uh, these O's and U's that appear um, so these kind of uh, are part of the Pluto SDR blocks and all of the FM comms blocks. Um, but we, we've kind of uh, grabbed this uh, kind of this O and U um, notation from the USRPs, if you're very familiar uh, with overflows, underflows, and those blocks. Um, now, in your application, uh, do these matter? Uh, do you care about uh, losing data uh, or you know pulling a buffer and having the next buffer not be continuous to that? So you know that's really dependent on uh, the application that you're going after. Um, the uh, another option is you know do can you work in bursts? Uh, if you get a big swath of RAM um, of data that's contiguous, uh, does that meet your needs? Um, you know successive uh, chunks of memory might not be contiguous, but uh, you know where your gaps are. Uh, can you create a flow graph to handle that? Um, and then the other I would say the other three or the the three other approaches. Uh, really kind of um, focus on knocking down the data. Um, so pulling out the, the signal of interest that we care about um, before passing things into GNU Radio. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how you might approach um, dealing with bursts um, or collecting large swaths of data. Um, and we'll do this from the perspective of GRIO. Uh, so if you look at the block masks uh, of a, a block like Pluto SDR source or FMCOM source, or the generic um, IEO source blocks, um, you'll see this parameter called buffer size. Now, what this actually does is that it defines how big um, buffers in the hardware uh, will be. So when I'm talking about hardware, I'm talking about actually Pluto itself. So how much space in DDR is it allocating uh, for samples? Um, and the, uh, the distinction here is that this buffer uh, will, be, uh, will be contiguous. So uh, any data uh, that's saved in it um, for, for a single buffer uh, will be contiguous guaranteed. Um, successive buffers uh, do not have that guarantee. Now, um, back in GNU Radio, uh, what we actually do is that we emit uh, a tag so that uh, when we get a fresh buffer, uh, we uh, tell everyone downstream that, hey, um, this is the start of a new buffer. Um, data before it might be discontiguous. And depending on how you build your flow graph, uh, it may be possible for you to handle uh, considerations where uh, buffers um, or uh, you know large, uh, I would say if you're talking about GR buffers, several GR buffers might be contiguous, um, but then you might have a break. Um, but you could easily identify that uh, with these tags. Um, so one thing to note is that um, these buffers can actually be pretty large, these hardware buffers. Um, so Pluto has 512 uh, megabytes of, of RAM on board. Um, uh, you know, so you technically can increase the, the default buffer, which is two to the 23 samples, um, and make that much, much larger. Um, and, and what that effect would have is uh, you could do a capture, which was very long, you know, multiple seconds at full speed, um, and then uh, pipe that back into GNU Radio, and you would have uh, lots and lots of what I might call GR uh, buffers, um, which the scheduler will handle, uh, 
um, that you, you could operate on uh, in, in, uh, in continuity. Now, when, if you bump up to something like the VCU 128, uh, which we support for that, uh, that quad board uh, and the single card that I showed previously, that has eight gig of uh, HBM on board. So that's a super high, uh, super high speed um, um, uh, memory interconnect. Um, now, uh, you know, eight gigs uh, isn't a lot when you're talking about multiple four gig sample converters. Um, but, uh, you know, if you needed to do a capture, um, that would uh, get you some a serious amount of time relatively. Now, the, the next step might actually be uh, trying to offload some of the processing into the FPGA itself. Uh, so, you know, there are great frameworks out there like RF knock, um, but uh, sometimes uh, when we're talking about doing processing in the FPGA, there are limits that you'll run into uh, when you're doing this processing. Um, so one of the, the common constraints is what we call Fmax rates. Um, so Fmax is the uh, maximum frequency uh, or maximum clock you can run in FPGA, uh, and this will be related to uh, some logic, you know, some DSP or some block RAM, um, and this will be really the upper limit of how fast you can run things. And this is generally a lot smaller than the achievable data rates by uh, the converters that we're talking about here. Um, therefore, you need to transition things um, where you're uh, processing multiple samples at a time if you really want at that rate. Um, or you can you know, channelize inside the FPGA, uh, add decimation to knock down the data rate. Um, and if you are looking at um, working in this area, um, developing IP in this area, um, two resources that I would highly recommend are um, if you look at the vectorized block library, uh, that's inside a shield coder. Um, or uh, the SSR or super sample rate blocks uh, inside uh, System Generator by Xilinx. Um, so these blocks are designed to work with multiple multiple samples at a time. Uh, they're like filters or um, you know, FFTs and things like that that will work at uh, giga sample rates. So if you want to run things at rate, um, there are options for you out there that exist in these tools. And they're all simulink based, so they're actually pretty straightforward to use. Um, now, another option is actually to use uh, some of the on-chip features that exist in parts. Um, say we have an application uh, where we're looking at a signal um, in, the, in the spectrum here. Um, you know, this is a lot of bandwidth. This is, uh, say, 6 gigahertz uh, of bandwidth. Um, but there really only are two signals that we, we, or two bands that we care about here. And say, you know, these are the things that we want to pull back into our device. Now, one thing we actually could do is we could say, hey, you know, why don't I uh, take this guy, shift him downward a little bit, and then I only need to pick out, you know, this swath of bandwidth. And here's kind of an example of that where we have some signal here, this uh, multi-carrier GSM um, that we're pulling in at uh, 245, uh, and then we use a NCO and downshift it uh, to the center of our band. And then we, can, we only have to return uh, data at uh, 122 megasamples a second. So you can you know, move around the data that you care about uh, and then return the data that's useful to you back to the device. Uh, and this is where we get into those channelizers that we kind of talked about before. So inside the 9081 and 9082, there are a coarse and fine DDCs where we have uh, NCOs um, that we can all independently shift so we can move those signals around in frequency and then decimate. So we can kind of, you know, pull the different parts of the spectrum that we care about in and uh, really reduce our data rate and uh, uh, you know, knock things down to something that's more acceptable in the FPGA or in GNU radio itself. So the final approach that um, I usually take is actually in regards to say like an application itself. So uh, say we wanted to build a 802.11 uh, beacon receiver. Um, so beacons in 802.11a um, actually are relatively infrequent. So here's kind of a beacon here, a beacon here, a beacon here. Um, they occur roughly every um, 100 milliseconds, depending on configuration. Um, however, to actually figure out where they are, you have to be continuously receiving because the, the network is random. Um, and on the bottom here, we actually have a, a flow graph uh, from uh, GR802.11, uh, where we're splitting out you know, frame detection and then processing. So once we actually detect the frame, uh, we can process it. And one technique we can use uh, is that we could actually put most of this kind of detection or synchronization um, math that we have to do, stuff that kind of has to always be running, throw that into the FPGA. And then once we know where the start of our frame is, we can kind of cut that out and then pass it back to GR on the host. 
And by doing this, if we're in the case of beacon, uh, a beacon receiver, where we only care about beacon packets, we can actually reduce the data rate that we're pushing back by 250x. So that's an extreme, extreme reduction in data rate that we see. Um, you know, and that could, uh, in, in GR, uh, doing, say, you know, this at uh, 20 megahertz or 20 mega samples a second would be complicated or challenging. Um, but, you know, say reduce that by 250, uh, that, that's pretty reasonable. You might be able to actually pull it off on like a Raspberry Pi or something. Now, just to kind of close things up here, um, you know, DirectRF devices are coming. Uh, they're, they're becoming more and more common. Um, they're coming with actually fixed logic inside them that you can take advantage of to knock things down to get the data back that you care about. Um, but as a user, you need to understand uh, where bottlenecks might exist in your system. Like, you know, if you want to do certain things in the FPGA, uh, what's the clocking limitations that you have there? You might have memory limits on uh, how fast you can actually write to DDR. Um, the link that you're using might actually not be capable, no matter if you're using 10 gig. Um, and where do you want to do processing in your system? So really, the mental model of real-time and GRR uh, and your radio needs to, needs to shift a bit. Um, that doesn't mean you, know, you can't use it. It just you need to have uh, certain expectations. And actually, what I say is you know, look at the data that you care about in GR and use the hardware, uh, use the features of the hardware that exist. Now, uh, so that's the conclusion of my talk. I want to thank everyone on the line. Um, so if, if you want to reach out to me, um, my username on GitHub is tfcollins, uh, and here's my email. Thank you.